I am um, so much from the head of the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. I'm going to moderate this conversation today. Let me welcome our distinguished guests today. Uh, first, Dr. Sue Ming-Chi, uh, who is the head of the European Studies Department of the, of the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. And also Mr. Peter Goretsky, uh, who is a senior analyst of the Institute of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Today's topic is uh, the globalization after the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, so we are going to talk about issues that are of common concern for all of us. What is going to happen after such a pandemic, such a, such a, a health, health security issue that has been threatening with, uh, with, with, the, with the whole republication of globalization, maybe even shrinking of globalization, what we can do, what is the specific role of China, and what to expect in the coming period. We are looking forward very much to this discussion because this, these are uh, issues of vital concern for, for, for both China, Hungary, and the whole world. So again, Thank you for your patience with the technical difficulties, and I would propose to go straight on to the conversation. Just one sentence about the format. So first, Mr. Xu uh, is going to have an expose uh, where he summarizes his, his basic plot presentation. Uh, then Mr. Goretsky replies to, to, to this statement. And then I will have some questions. And in the meantime, I welcome from the audience further questions because from roughly one hour on, we are going to pose uh, questions from the audience as well. So this much about the format. And now, Mr. Xu, please, the floor is yours. Have your expose. Okay, it seems that the connection is not really working uh, with our Chinese colleagues. Okay, so is this the future of globalization? We're not. I honestly don't know what to do now. Shall we start the conversation, Tomas? And Mr. Uh, Dr. Xu will join us, hopefully. Um, it, for quite some time. Yes. No. No. How, no. How, how, how about the uh, voice? Is it clear? Smooth? Than before? Mr. Xu, your connection is faltering. No. How, how is my connection? Now? Connection is okay? N n now we hear you, but, but before this point, we didn't hear you for like... Okay, 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 now. You only got one, you Okay, I'm sorry. Connection has some problems. I think, uh, thank you for organizing these uh, discussions through uh, internet. Although the network is not so, you know, working quite, uh, you know, smoothly. Yeah. It should be some, some, some problems in the future, although we can meet uh, in the uh, internet. But, uh, the result may not be so, uh, you know, uh, so good as we we rely so heavily on this uh, new technology of the pandemic. So I think uh, what I like to first to uh, emphasize is that uh, this pandemic already hit the global economy very hard, especially in two ways. One is this virus itself caused a lot of people sick and hospitalized, which lead to the government in many countries you know, uh, try to reduce the social and economic activities. 
prevent uh, further infection. And of course, this will have very much negative impact on the economic activities that already lead to the deep recession of the world economy. And the second is that the expectations for the economic growth in the future is quite negative, pessimistic. And this leads to enormous drop of the trade and investment activities. So already the big panic in the financial market in turn to have an impact on activities. In US, Europe, very much severe this pandemic already. So we have some consensus on the definition of society that this is both coming recession world It seems that the connection is, is again faltering. I don't know if we can do anything about it from here. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Um, okay, now it's back. Now we can see you, Mr. Xu. But we cannot hear him. He's muted again. You're muted. Your mic, sir. Okay. Is it? Uh... Now we can hear you. You can hear me now. Okay. Uh, First, I mentioned that this uh, pandemic already caused a very serious world economy recession. Uh, worst the second, since the Second World War. Only a few countries could maintain positive growth rate this year. I think China is one of them. Uh, I think another point I would like to mention is that, uh, you know, the pandemic itself, you know, it's a problem, however, the way to handle the pandemic and uh, you know some countries in the world using the pandemic to promote that your political you know, strategic target lead to the incorporation or you know the cooperation of the countries you know some efforts which is very much needed to Contain the pandemic, you know, uh, infections and uh, inventions, which we have not seen until now. Yesterday, U.S. declared that uh, they are going to withdraw from the World Health Organization. You know, and this sort of, uh, you know, international, you know, conflict in the world deep recession period. I think myself believe worst thing that we should have. You know, actually we need further cooperation among countries. Now we see the opposite, and uh, international society seems to me that uh, is going to a kind of a uh, split, which will not really happen. We know combat is common you know, enemy, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think um, this is a kind of a kind of, a, I mean, you know, thing that worries me very much, you know. Of course, before the pandemic outbreak, nationalism and populism was already you know, on an upsurge trend. And during this pandemic, 
expansion, you know. And it allows further this kind of uh, nationalism, which, you know, is not really good for us to recover from very deep recession. So I think this is taking this very extreme, you know, uh, policy to deal with the problem. And I hope that China and Europe, especially China and some Central European countries, we need to come together and to cooperate in both the, 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 the fighting against this pandemic uh, expansions uh, in terms of the vaccine and uh, pharmaceutical drugs you know, uh, uh, production and the research. And the second is to you know, cooperate further in promoting you know, bilateral trade and investment, which I believe it's very important for us to you know, get relief of the pandemic <clears throat> and to maintain uh, globalization or global value chain and production chain. So I think uh, this afternoon's discussion will provide that kind of uh, platform for us to discuss further in what way we can cooperate and, uh, and, and to understand better the world economy in the future and you know, to, 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 to preserve the value that we believe and we have common senses or common beliefs then you know to make our life better or at least you know not really uh, eat continuously at this COVID-19 pandemic. So I will stop here and then discuss with you further in detail the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, before I pass the word on to Mr. Goretsky, uh, let me again apologize from <laughs> back for apology for from from our audience uh, because we are facing technical difficulties in connection, and uh, I I now think that it's going to be perfectly well uh, anytime soon. So there should be other. Uh, there could be other uh, phases of time when, when it should occur. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, we are doing our best to, to avoid it. Uh, but please, Mr. Goretsky, uh, so what is your take on the issues that Mr. Xu just raised? Thank you, uh, Mr. Borani. Um, I will be quite short, partly due to, to, to the uh, quality of, of connections. So I could hear uh, quite badly Dr. Xu's comment, but maybe I take on what he uh, mentioned about uh, the need for economic cooperation global and the need for seeking global solutions in uh, today's uh, situation. He mentioned the vaccine development against uh, COVID-19. I think this is an ex excellent example for a field, for, a, for, a, for an issue where uh, global cooperation is, I think, absolutely realistic. So. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the pharmaceutical innovation. It's maybe the most complex and most costly uh, innovation process uh, in every kind of industry and in the whole world. Uh, with the emergence of biotechnology, bioengineering or, or genetics, pharmaceutical innovation has become so complex that even uh, big pharma uh, companies cannot afford to have every skills, every capabilities, every knowledge in-house. So today, the pharmaceutical uh, innovation is based on, let's say, global knowledge, on the flow of, uh, on international flow of, uh, of, of technology and knowledge. So I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that uh, uh, the vaccine development against COVID-19 uh, will see uh, substantial cooperation, at least at the corporate level, between pharma companies in the US, in China, in India, uh, and in Europe. And uh, Dr. Chu uh, mentioned uh, also that we should uh, promote bilateral trade and investment cooperation in the coming period. In this uh, field, I'm a bit more, more skeptic as we could see uh, restrictive measures and tightening measures in these two fields even before the pandemic. And uh, I think uh, global FDI flows will drop in the coming uh, uh, period 
uh, purely due to, to, the, to the economic downturn that we are perceiving today. And we can remember uh, the trade war between the US and China. We can remember the trade tensions between the United States and the EU even before, before the pandemic. I think these tendencies will prevail. However, even the most developed uh, economies will have to find uh, the way for, for cooperation in the post-COVID era, just because they will need to take the advantage of economic cooperation in the field of trade and, and, uh, and investment in order to, uh, to, uh, to shorten uh, the crisis period and, and revitalize their economies. So again, I also stop here and, and look forward uh, to your questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So from, on the one hand, <coughs> so, and we, we quite agree on the desperate need of international cooperation, uh, also between China and Central European nations, because, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic just doesn't know country borders and that's pretty much a transnational global issue uh, that actually requires uh, you know, global measures to, to, to combat uh, and we also identified vaccine development as one of the key areas where international cooperation uh, can easily be attained. However, uh, those are times when there, there are, on one hand we, we we witness the raising of international tensions. And on the other hand, we witness um, the, the disruption of uh, global trade and global economy. So my question to you is, uh, how do you see, how, to, to what extent is uh, the economy hurt? Because it, it renders uh, international cooperation uh, much more difficult than before the COVID-19. So what do you think, what will be the net impact of COVID-19 in, 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 the, in the medium run uh, on global economy? And uh, if they are very adversical, how to, how to avoid the most negative impacts? So in short, the question, so how will the economy ch change uh, in, the, in, the, in the short and medium run and how to, how to still further international cooperation in this field. Of course, yes. You ask me to talk about these uh, questions? Okay, I think, first of all, pandemic already, you know, uh, hit international trade and investment because on many grounds, like, uh, you know, uh, people, people contact, and business to business contact has been reduced. And, you know, uh, good international transportation also had been, you know, uh, cut off because of the social distance and lockdowns in many, you know, areas. So it has negative impact on that. And the second is that some countries believe that, uh, you know, the industries originally it's only commercial uh, meanings. Uh, where it was cheap, then they're going to uh, produce there or purchase from that spot. But now, suddenly, some countries believe uh, these kind of uh, products or industry becoming very important in terms of uh, security, national security. So they would like to bring them back. Uh, so, and it's going to have negative impact on the trade and the international investment. So all these have negative impact. And also some countries in order to prevent domestic market you know, to be you know, used by others, uh, kind of a protectionist tendency is on its rise. So I think it's going to have, to have very negative impact in the short or even medium term, uh, two or three years. It would be very difficult to recover the pre-pandemic period. However, I believe that uh, the world market is still there. No any one country, even US, not to say China, can you know 100 percent go back, you know, look inward, prevent any trade with other with the rest of the world. And even the policy maker like US, Trump administration, they are still trying to negotiate with China 
try to open the Chinese market, ask China to buy more U.S. products. That means international market. The other countries demand. It's still very important. So comparative advantage will still play a very important role in the future. So I believe that in the long run, you know, global production chain and global value chain and international trade will still be very important to almost every country. And every country still need a global world market. So the, 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 the problem is that some of the, you know, uh, rule and principle governing the international trade and investment need to be adjusted. Uh, then we need a kind of international dialogue, operation, discussion, to find a way to solve the conflict and to solve the, the problems actually already occurred before pandemic. And pandemic, you know, this and pandemic showed us that coming together and negotiate and try to find a way to solve the problems and conflict and then you know make consensus to build that kind of a new you know, architecture or international regulation that fits to most of the country's interests. I think this is very important. I believe that something is changing already and also is continuing changing. The basic law rule of the market of these uh, uh, economics still be there and globalization is not really 100% going to be reversed. And there will be some kind of uh, adjustment of the globalization. But I still believe that the globalization needs to preserve. So that's why Chinese government authority try to persuade the international society uh, many problems occur. It's not the cause of the globalization. It is because that the globalization brings problems and, 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 and the imbalance that need us to come together to solve the problem. I see. Mr. Goreski, what's your take on those issues? Uh, I would take this question from a little uh, different perspective. Uh, so for me, it's very interesting to see now how uh, given countries and, and regions and locations try to, to position themselves in the, in the post-COVID era, how they try to find uh, the breakthrough points, how they try to transform all these crises into, let's say, an, an opportunity for, for economic um, development. During the lockdown, the Polish pollution levels dropped, and I think many policymakers uh, are now examining ways how to uh, move in the future towards a more uh, sustainable economic growth. And there are a couple of examples worldwide for countries doing uh, uh, or following this route. For example, there's the German state, uh, Saxony Anhalt. And this German state today makes spectacular efforts to establish a more sustainable automotive industry. They have a long history in automotive innovation and now uh, Saxony Anhalt is uh, positioning itself as a green hydrogen uh, state. They have around uh, 270 automotive uh, supplier companies in field. They have the necessary talent pool. They have the uh, very established uh, innovation and university background. And at the same time, the location offers enormous potential in renewable energy and have a lot of companies being expert in the usage and production, industrial production of hydrogen. And with uh, combining these capabilities and building on the increasing need for, for sustainable economy, uh, now this German state actively promotes uh, itself as a hub for future uh, mobility technology. Or there is the example of Poland. Uh, Poland actually managed to increase its FDI inflows in the first four months of this year. So uh, during the whole first wave uh, of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and this uh, increase in the number of new FDI projects in the first four months uh, in this year in Poland, the increase came from, from renewable energy, actually. Poland announced 16 renewable energy related FDI projects uh, from January to, to end of April. 
just to compare it uh, to, to, the, to the number one year before, in uh, 2019, in the same period, uh, there was one renewable energy related pro a new FDI project in Poland. And uh, not only Poland, but Norway uh, saw a similar trend in, in, uh, in FDI uh, projects related to renewable energy. So it's very interesting that this, <coughs> this sector, this uh, industry today doesn't really experience a downturn and there can be even an increase uh, in FDI inflows. Or there is the example of Portugal, uh, which country uh, tries to position itself as an emerging uh, technology hub and operates with the message that they were able to fight with COVID-19 successfully and show a relative resilience building on their, uh, their digital uh, networks, building on the digital infrastructure ecosystem and, and, and skilled labor. Anyway, it seems that the technology sector uh, could be even a winner uh, of this crisis. Many sectors uh, reported uh, devastation due to the economic downturn, uh, but tech companies uh, seem to be or seem to prove more resilient to, to, to today's uh, uh, economic uh, crisis. In early May, almost all the big tech companies reported quite stable uh, earnings. In April, Facebook declared that uh, it would hire more than 10,000 new employees uh, by the end of uh, this year. Amazon, Google, Apple, uh, all hiring data engineers, uh, scientists, designers, at least um, according to, uh, to job listings. So all these information, these trends uh, point towards that companies will uh, need to rethink their investment promotion uh, strategies. On one hand, uh, as the crisis uh, starts to bite, every single workplace will be more uh, appreciated. But other hand, uh, the post-COVID era uh, provides an opportunity uh, to move towards a more sustainable FDI mix, a more sustainable FDI stock uh, with a shift uh, towards uh, more uh, crisis-proof industries. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now I propose to, to step one step behind even further uh, and and take a take an even more structural look so my question relates to the global value chains <coughs> the global value chains uh, are in a shift and there is a lot of talk about uh, the need to shift them uh, that is obviously uh, a set of reasons which are politically motivated there are another set of reasons which relate to uh, to health security issues, like we should have shorter value chains because they are not as much exposed to global challenges than the very long ones. But also, uh, there is a certain tendency from countries uh, to, and companies uh, to have shorter or a little uh, modified value chains. So my question is, shall we fear of the modification of global value chains? Is it something that is engendered by international tensions and the virus? Or is this a natural process of which we can also benefit, of which China can benefit or the European countries benefit? So my question is, uh, shall we fear of uh, the changing of the global value chains and how they change actually? Mr. Xu, so what is your answer? Okay, I think uh, global value chain is going to adjust according to the pandemic. And even before the pandemic, you know, uh, the adjustment is already beginning, you know. Uh, I, I think uh, on the one side is that the global value chain is constantly adjusting according to the comparative cost of the factor of the production, labor, land, and you know, these uh, government uh, regulation. Uh, however, I think uh, now pandemic, you know, remind many government that uh, we should, you know, be friendly to the environment and be, you know, uh, alert to the production that is you know, to the national security. Although some countries uh, oddly, you know, uh, interpreted, you know, the, 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 the uh, national security. For many 
you know, under the national security, which uh, it's not really wise. I don't think that uh, we can keep many, many years long that to put uh, many, many industries under the national security. However, some of the uh, products and industries is more linked to the national security. And I think in the future, global production chain on, on these industries is going to be uh, uh, adjusted. However, I think uh, global value chain will still be there. You know. and even you know, from the perspective of these uh, you know, uh, sustainable growth and uh, containing the emission of the potent of greenhouse gas, this sort of emission, you know, I think uh, there will be still that, you know, some production and need to be, you know, allocated worldwide to gain, you know, most efficiency, achieve this so-called productivity, you know. Because this is a market economy. Most of the countries follow the market economy basic rule. That is the highest economy efficiency, gain the highest profit. As for a company, this will not change. You know, the government cannot subsidize all the industries. And if the company you know, still need a market, and, and, and they are going to uh, produce where near the market, and to produce where the cost is the lowest. So that basic regulation rule, I think, will still be there. However, there will be some adjustment after pandemic, you know, and the comparative cost and advantage you know, among countries changing. So. You know, global value chain is going to be changed. And the globalization of global value chain is the symbolic of the division of labor, division of international labor, which brings us high efficiency and productivity. And this will not really be to change. What will change is the government regulation and, uh, you know, some of the, you know, uh, you know, uh, political consideration or geopolitical consideration, which uh, rules and regulations that will change the comparative cost and comparative advantage, then this is going to change. I think pandemic have both negative impact on the globalization and positive impact on the globalization. After pandemic, and after this adjustment, I believe that the, uh, some of the imbalance and problems of the globalization will be corrected. For instance, during this pandemic, you know, the gap between rich and poor, the division of uh, distribution and, and uh, inequality, disparity of the income and wealth, to some extent, need to be, you know, uh, tackled especially under the you know, expansion and hit by serious pandemic. The government have to you know, launch a lot of uh, uh, physical plan to help these poor. You know. And later on, I think you know, many countries, uh, they have to tax higher uh, the, 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 on these big companies, on these uh, globalized companies. Okay. And this, in this regard, I think also international cooperation needed, like this uh, uh, the digital economy tax. Now, EU and US has, uh, have different views and even conflict. And in this regard, I believe that international cooperation and international negotiation is needed. And to some extent, this reflects that uh, even digital economy you know, you need a global market. You, know, you cannot really just take all the economic activities within the you know, home country's boundary. This is impossible now. Even like US, like EU, uh, you know, one market, and like China, 
you know, we still need each other. You know, we cannot really separate and then build our own, you know, market not to you know, connect to, to each other. And this, you know, is against basic law of, you know, uh, technology development and science and technology development and against the basic law of the, you know, economy. But I think this is my understanding. You know, I, I think that uh, there will be a lot of change, but the basic, you know, uh, rule okay, will be still you know, there. That's my Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I completely agree with uh, with the starting comment of, of Dr. Chu that uh, that uh, global value chains were already seeing some adjustment before the pandemic. I would only like to add that, uh, in my perspective, not only an adjustment, but they were already going through a major transformation process. And the US-China trade war surely had its impact on, on regional value chains, especially in Asia. But I think the major driving force of this transformation process is this technology development. As Industry 4.0 changes fundamentally the way how uh, companies create value. Uh, it has been already a clear trend uh, in the global FDI flows before the, the pandemic. Then an increasing number of companies located uh, uh, manufacturing activity closer to their uh, core markets and, and, and final customers. So the era of, of linear value chains, I think, was already over before, before the pandemic, as companies were engaged in establishing uh, value-creating ecosystems, uh, let's say, instead. And as a result, uh, when selecting their new uh, or next uh, investment locations, companies started to look for locations that can offer a combination and, uh, and good capabilities, not only in the single industry, but combination of capabilities, functions, and, and uh, certain industry segments. And as a result, it has clearly become a more uh, complex question. What is the value proposal for a, of a country? What is the value proposal of a location uh, for an FDI project? So now we have, have the question, I think this was the situation before uh, the, the COVID-19 swept uh, across the globe. Now the question is how the pandemic influences all, all these trends. Uh, the so-called Institute for Supply uh, Management uh, made a survey in, well, somewhere late February, early March among uh, US-based companies. And uh, they found that 75% of, of responding companies experienced some kind of turbulence, some kind of disruption in their uh, supply chains uh, due to the pandemic outbreak. So the coronavirus virus has certainly pointed at at least one aspect of today's uh, value chains, and this is uh, vulnerability, especially in, in, in the case of those uh, um, that depend largely on, on Chinese uh, input. In the last, uh, let's say, two or three decades, the main driver of, of creating uh, value, global value chains or regional value chains was cost minimization. But uh, this resulted in, in a decrease of flexibility, which would have been a very essential um, uh, feature uh, to treat uh, unexpected uh, disruptions. So now, today, the question is, how can companies get prepared for the unexpected uh, in the future? Uh, the PwC made a survey and uh, they found that uh, in the post-COVID era, uh, more most probably more attention uh, will be paid to the evaluation of the financial status of suppliers and, and their diversification. So in order to, to get prepared uh, for the unexpected, companies will need to have more insight uh, to supplier status at the tier two level and also beyond in order to have uh, sufficient time uh, to make alternative plans with their uh, tier one uh, supplier. And I think today there is a wide consensus that besides a closer cooperation with, with suppliers, also the new uh, industry 4.0 related uh, supply chain technologies can improve the visibility throughout the entire uh, supply chain and also its resilience uh, against turbulences. So um, applying technologies uh, like AI, like 5G, like robotics uh, in the future uh, will most probably uh, lead uh, 
uh, or transform traditional ch supply chains to to so-called uh, digital supply networks that will be hopefully characterized by more uh, flexibility and and resilience and according to to a survey made by by the boston uh, consulting group in 2016 uh, those companies uh, that apply uh, some kind of uh, digital technology in their supply chains can react 25 percent faster uh, to sudden market condition changes compared to those uh, um, companies that do not apply uh, such uh, technologies. Um, so, um, as I've mentioned uh, earlier, even before the pandemic outbreak, uh, there was a trend that uh, a number of companies uh, relocated manufacturing activity closer to their core markets in order to, to be able to provide um, more, um, let's say more tailored products, more tailored services to their final customers. I think the pandemic could uh, reinforce uh, this process as uh, through uh, this relocation, also the logistics risks, logistics risk could be, uh, could be, uh, could be uh, decreased. And a few words about, about uh, China. Uh, I think uh, China already started to lose its position as uh, the world's factory before the pandemic outbreak due to rising production costs to partly due to the US uh, China trade war and partly due to the emergence of uh, alternative manufacturing locations in the neighborhood, um, namely Southeast Asia. So I think in the post COVID era, this trend may gain some additional momentum. However, I don't expect that a large number of multinational companies will leave uh, China because of two reasons. One is costs. Uh, um, I could uh, read in the media uh, this week that, uh, that the CEO of Valeo, it's a French uh, automotive supplier, uh, mentioned that their uh, customers are not ready to pay more uh, if the company's supply chain is relocated. So cost is still uh, a very, uh, very substantial issue. And besides cost considerations, that, well, China is an attractive and growing and huge market. And for many Western companies and multinational companies, it absolutely makes sense to have some kind of manuf local manufacturing activity in China and keep uh, some kind of local manufacturing activity in China, despite uh, this transformation of, of global value chains and despite all the effects uh, of the pandemic. So to summarize and to put it in a nutshell, I think technology driven transformational chance of supply chains will most probably uh, speed up in the post uh, COVID era and the diversification and flexibility will be more appreciated. And uh, as for uh, location selection of FDI projects, I think we will see we will see uh, relocation, we will see nearshoring, and we will see outsourcing uh, at the same time. Yes, I, I, I think uh, I quite agree with you. It is the technology that uh, uh, driving these uh, adjustments, or you would say the relocation and energy. And uh, you know, those who, you know, uh, and you know, first, you know, take the advantage of the technology breakthrough will be successful in the market. And the shape of this uh, supply chain or this value chain is going to change, you know, uh, to some extent by the new technology, you know, have been, you know, adopted in the industries and the companies level. And this is for sure. And so uh, it's not that uh, totally uh, of uh, you know, anti-globalization or deglobalization process. It's just an adjustment because of technology development. And even the pandemic you know, didn't really change this uh, basic trend. And it is the, you know, a trend that happened already before this pandemic. Of course, geopolitical consideration and political, uh, you know, um, you know, conflict between the countries will affect some of these uh, reallocation, re, yeah, yes, relocation of, uh, uh, you know, production chain. 
but it's not really decisive factor. That's my conclusion. Yes, I quite agree with you that uh, as compared to the technology you know, advance and the development, I think your political is the secondary factor. You know, it's going to affect the relocation and adjustment of the globalization and the value chain. Thank you. Of course, uh, your, uh, your political consideration is important, but it's less important than the technology development. Yes, I agree. Yeah, okay. It's quite a good news for, for medium-sized countries who have no such influence on world trade that, uh, or geopolitics, that geopolitics is uh, not as much as it as an issue than globalization itself. My next question relates to that uh, because I'm wondering how, so Mr. Xu mentioned that there should be a new consensus about, about work trade, about, uh, about the role and mechanisms of globalization. Uh, but I'm wondering if, um, how, how can a new consensus in those areas could be reached uh, Especially that uh, that this is a heavily contested era uh, area, uh, especially after the COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, so, how do you get a new consensus on globalization, and uh, what is China's role in uh, reshaping globalization or reaching a new consensus in it? In many of these anti-globalization sentiment or these uh, uh, de-globalization, you know. Uh, you know, kind of a, a request or demand basically come from, you know, these uh, welfare distribution, yeah. imbalanced welfare and profit or you know, benefits distribution among the countries and among different, uh, different social groups. We see that, uh, you know, enormous wealth and benefits from the you know, globalization, which you know, basically come from the, the productivity you know, uh, rising. Uh, and companies make enormous more you know, profits, especially these big companies, tech companies. However, you know, tax function decreased, social wealth function you know, decreased in Many developed countries who caused a lot of unsatisfaction. Then these unsatisfaction and uh, <clears throat> even to some extent hatred, you know, has been shifted or guided, you know, oriented to globalization and to external, you know, uh, factors. Then, you know, became a kind of a you know, geopolitical you know, issue. Actually, it's basic problems of the you know, redistribution. I think if we could uh, uh, have this consensus among the, you know, global society, international society, then we will come down together to some of the common, you know, uh, kind of uh, action to prevent these multinational corporations to make profit from shifting from one country to other countries uh, to take less environmental production responsibility and to uh, you know try to escape the tax burden you know from their home country. And then we can have international, you know, basic regulations and uh, law to prevent that. And then international you know, cooperation will gradually lead globalization into a much better, much better shaped globalization. Not like today, you know, it's a kind of a wild capitalist, you know, uh, you know globalization. Most of the profits goes to these capitalists 
while the majority of working class do not really benefit from this you know, globalization. I think this is the main problem. Like uh, Kerry already too in his famous you know, books. Uh, I think like international society like G20 or even uh, some other uh, international platform come down to some basic principle you know, to uh, govern this tax haven and not let this multinational corporation to hide that you know, uh, profit in the tax haven and to pay you know, rather decent tax and, and could solve the physical you know, problems in many, many developed countries, which running a deficit in the government you know, uh, revenue. So I think this is only one example. There are many others, like international uh, environmental protection, emission, you know, uh, global warming problems, and uh, many others. And uh, uh, cross-border crime, and infectious disease like this uh, uh, pandemic, you know, like the COVID-19 you know, uh, diseases. And, and, and I think we, we, we need a kind of uh, international cooperation. And we can actually make basic consensus and then, to, you know, take some common actions to, to lead to much lighter, you know, kind of, a, uh, you know, richest result. Now we don't see this kind of, uh, you know, operation because many countries domestic domestic you know politics you know, govern all the topics. Then you know politicians only sees the votes, and then you know they try to make skeptical externally, and problems becoming much you know difficult to solve. So I think this is the problem. I think. Uh, and it is in this area, China and Europe, you know, need to cooperate further. And we should have common, you know, uh, values and consensus you know, to some extent, I think. That's my answer to this question. Okay, so... Uh... Let's start with that. Uh, I think it's very important to, to emphasize that, uh, uh, let's put it this way, so economic distancing uh, was already on the rise before the pandemic outbreak. So there are trends and, and tensions uh, on the surface or under the surface that, uh, were, uh, that were contributing to the rise of, uh, of, uh, of trade tensions, of uh, introducing FDI screening mechanisms uh, before the pandemic outbreak. We, can, we could see the European Union introducing such a uh, mechanism uh, in order to, uh, to prevent company takeovers that can be considered as sensitive from, from the perspective of national security. And I think it's important uh, to see that, that uh, national security uh, has become a more important and the more emphasized uh, factor of economic decisions and discussions of high-level politicians already uh, before, uh, before the pandemic. So I think uh, in the post-COVID uh, era, there will be a greater tendency to emphasize a strong uh, strategic autonomy and the European Union uh, will want to keep more strategic activities uh, in its uh, own hands. But also there are two, uh, two major factors on the other side of the story. Uh, one, uh, I have already referred to it that uh, even the major economies uh, will have to uh, find or may will have to take the advantage of, of international economic cooperation in order to, to pass the crisis as, as fast as possible out of this downturn as uh, quickly uh, as possible. And the second factor is that, in my view, that the pandemic demonstrated uh, or accelerated the process of digitalization that was already underway in the global economy and demonstrated uh, the importance of high quality network connectivity. And uh, in a digital data driven economy, 
uh, I think all economic players are interlinked with each other uh, increasingly, purely due to the, to the nature of technology. So I think the world altogether will, will not deglobalize uh, economically, but we will see more, uh, more emphasis uh, placed on strategic autonomy uh, and national security. So these two trends, these two directions will, will prevail uh, on the medium run. Uh, I think. As for your question regarding a, a new consensus, in terms of trade and, and investment, I'm a, uh, a bit skeptic that we will see a consensus uh, in the short run or in the middle run, because of those reasons I've mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of uh, this uh, comment from my side, that there were already forces on the surface or under the surface before the pandemic outbreak in these two fields, in investment, uh, protection or investment uh, um, screening and, and trade relations. And today I see that, or I perceive that uh, the pandemic only reinforced these tensions, only reinforced uh, these trends. On the other hand, uh, that part or that field of globalization that is driven by, by technology development will move on. And I think there is uh, a consensus or, or uh, let's say, an agreement uh, in interest is realistic, as I think uh, most countries are interested in uh, in moving on uh, on uh, with with technology development and utilizing these new technologies uh, in order to to reboot uh, boot their economies. And a few words about the role uh, of China. If we take a look at the scale and speed of uh, the economic development of China in the last uh, two decades, I think we can declare that. China was a beneficiary of economic uh, globalization. So keeping uh, the form of economic globalization we knew before the pandemic is, an, let's say, an interest uh, of China. Uh, and China has recently reached uh, the level of economic power that now it's not only a beneficiary of economic globalization, but also a driving force. And it has enough power to start uh, shaping uh, the globalization uh, processes. So in the post-COVID era, I think there will be fields of globalization or economic globalization that will slow down. I think uh, global FDI flows uh, can be mentioned here. Uh, merger, company merger and acquisitions in uh, certain economic sectors and bilateral economic relations between certain countries. But on the other hand, economic globalization will, uh, will move on and move on and, and uh, maybe become even faster in those fields that are driven uh, by technology development. And as an em uh, em emerging economic uh, and technological superpower, I think China is well positioned to be a driving force in those fields of, of globalization that are driven uh, by new technologies. I see, thank you. Um, in the meantime, <coughs> we've received a question from Anna Keller. Uh, who is inquiring about the role of the World Trade Organization. Uh, and so maybe uh, a, a little broaden this question uh, to, to the fact that can the World Trade Organization be a place when such a new consensus or you know, the normalization of World Trade could actually happen? Uh, what is the specific role it may play in such a process? <coughs> And also, there have been a number of candidates uh, to, to lead the World Trade Organization in the future as, as director uh, from different regions of the world. Uh, and uh, the, the participant also inquires what is the position of China on who should, uh, who should be a good candidate and uh, what are the specific reforms China is, uh, is advocating in this uh, organization. So in a nutshell, uh, the role of the World Trade Organization in this process, if you might. Uh, Mr. Xu, uh, what is your answer to this? Okay, first of all, World Trade Organization is an important international architecture for maintaining the basic, you know, uh, rule and the regulation on the international trade. And even though now these, uh, you know, dispute, you know, uh, settled 
mechanism, you know, seems pretty severely by this, uh, you know, suspending of this approved body uh, because of the U.S. Uh, boycott on the new appointment of the judges. Uh, we all know that. Uh, even though I think uh, WTO still it's most important architecture for countries rely the international trade, uh, which is important for their economy. I, I think uh, few countries will say that the WTO organization is not important, except the United States. And it, even in the, in the United States, that uh, there are many people, even government officials, uh, do not really agree with uh, Trump's administration's, uh, you know, policy towards uh, international organizations, especially WTO and WHO. He recently, Biden already said if he got elected, he would, you know, immediately join WHO again. So you will see, you know, uh, these international organizations represent the kind of a basic order and rule. And even developed countries, strong countries need this kind of organization, you know, to provide a kind of a fair playground, you know, for all the countries to participate in this fair playground. Even though some regulations rules are not so satisfactory uh, from this perspective or that perspective, then we can come down, discuss to reform it, not really to you know, go in or even rid of it. Then we are going to a chaos. And when we are in a chaos that the big countries like the United States and China, you know, we suffer too, but slightly. And small countries, medium-sized countries will suffer more, I guess, because in the trade and in the, in the international society and some other matters, if there is no rule, then you know, these big countries can bully others. And, and this is not a you know, fair and a good situation. So I, th I, I think that the WTO is very important. And of course, China benefit from the WTO and join, after joining the WTO, we you know, uh, uh, experience uh, rapid uh, uh, trade development and economic development. And we don't deny that China benefits from international uh, trade uh, architecture and the system and the globalization. So I think uh, this is quite uh, you know, obvious. So China tried to maintain preserve this international system and also agree that uh, we need to reform it. Uh, we need to come down together to negotiate a consensus and to reform and rather to improve the uh, uh, order and the system than to demolish it. No, that's very clear. As for you know, who is going to be the next you know, director general I, I, I don't think the Chinese government have quite clear idea. Personally, I believe that the next one should not only be a kind of a, pro, a professional, you know, expert in the international trade and the law, legal perspective, and should also have some, you know, quality as a, you know, very capable diplomat, you know, official. And uh, can bridge between developed countries and developing countries. And to some extent, need also have some quality, at least access to the biggest, strongest country in the world right now, the United States, to persuade them to coming back to the WTO framework. Yeah. And this is ideal task for the next. Director General. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to you know, preserve WTO and to work, you know, the WTO framework. That's my view. Okay. Uh, Dr. Su, you are absolutely right that uh, the next Director General of WTO will be a good diplomat. 
But uh, who will be the person? I don't have my crystal ball with me here, so I I wouldn't uh, make a guess. But I absolutely agree that uh, the WTO should be the place to to arrange uh, international trade related uh, disputes and and regulate uh, international trade. Uh, the future of WTO is a is a question. Of well, of course, the presidential elections in the United States will, will have or not, we shall see an effect on, on, on the future of, of WTO as well. Today, uh, well, uh, the first wave of, of COVID-19 is over in some countries. Uh, in other countries, we still experience uh, peaks and, and, and the further outbreaks and, uh, and stuff like that. So I don't think that the reform of the WTO will be a fast process and uh, we I don't think that we are going to see substantial developments in the let's say next half or, or one year. I project or a story uh, of the middle term. Yes, I agree. I agree. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I go on with some of the other questions posed by the audience uh, because uh, we are we are getting close to our time limit. Uh, I, uh, I try to be quick. Uh, so one is how how the pandemic situation uh, affects China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, how uh, how it will shape and change the whole structure? Will it be you know uh, reignited uh, soon, or it will be uh, on a different track in the future? So what is your take on this, Mr. Su? My personal observation is that the pandemic has some negative impact on the Belt and Road, some projects, especially some investment projects, because of the social distance and because of these uh, lockdowns in some areas and process of the existing investment projects have been slowing down. This is negative impact. I think uh, trade, you know, between China and these Belt and Road countries actually is not really, you know, uh, contracting. It's growing now. Trade between China and the Belt and Road countries is expanding. You know, growth rate between uh, you know, growth rate of the trade between China and uh, Belt and Road countries is. is uh, growing faster than Chinese trade with other parts like the US uh, with Western Europe. So I think uh, to some extent, Southern Road is a long, long, long run, you know, uh, project. Uh, it's a big international platform, you know, contains, you know, uh, international trade, investment, and people-to-people -people culture exchange. Of course, people-to-people -people culture exchange stopped for a while now because of the you know, part of these international traveling. Now. It's becoming very difficult now. I think soon uh, China, Europe will resume these uh, international flight, I, I guess. Uh, tourism is still potentially a big area, those of us operate. But right now, it has some negative impact. So in the long run, I think pandemic will not really, you know, uh, hit or uh, hard or prevent the continuing, you know, progress of the uh, projects between the road countries and China. And I think the uh, operation will be continued. But right now, yes, some negative impact already happened. Just like uh, China, the relation between China and many other countries. That's my answer. Help and go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any comments from your side on this matter? Uh, well, Dr. Shu is right there, so he knows much more about what's going on uh, 
in in BR in the regarding the BR projects. Well, uh, from my side, I only anticipate that uh, uh, similarly to uh, sustainability could be a more emphasized factor uh, in BRI related projects as well. Uh, so maybe China and participating countries evaluate more deeply uh, which projects uh, will be profitable, which projects uh, can be can be implemented and, and maybe there will be projects uh, that will drop uh, due to due to, to due to economic reasons. That's that's why I see. Ah yes, I think you are right. I think it's very correct, you know, the sustainability of the projects. It's very important. If it's not sustainable, I think the company investing in business in the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is going to lose money. You know, they are, they are going to suffer. You know, and another thing is the environmental uh, uh, issues, sustainability, you know, development. Uh, it's also very important because in China, I think Chinese top leaders like Xi Jinping emphasized several times again that three, we, we call it three, you know, tasks. The first one is to containing the macroeconomic risk, especially financial risk. The second one is this uh, reducing the pollution and protect uh, environmental protection. The third one is the relief of the poverty, reduce the poverty, absolute number of the poverty. These three are not really going to be affected by this pandemic. Whatever happens, original target of these uh, three to be implemented. This is already become a, a kind of administra administrative, you know, order, you know, from top government and top leader down to uh, local government. I think uh, these uh, the road initiative is also going to be affected. Sustainability, the environment, the environmental protection is becoming more and more, you know, important and noticed by the company uh, carry out these uh, uh, projects in the country's concern. Thank you. And maybe just one final question, uh, which is going to be pretty practical in my view. Um, so in China, Hungary or China, Central Europe uh, relations, so what, what, are the, what are the things that we should do uh, in order to in order to strengthen uh, the economic recovery of one another. So what are the specific steps that we should, we should do uh, in order to uh, you know, put back on track uh, our, our mutual relationship, our, uh, our previous trade relations? So is there anything that, for instance, the Hungarian government or Central European governments or the Chinese government for that matter could do about that? So, in short, uh, what about the bilateral trade relations? What is your take on that, Mr. Xu? Well, I think uh, Hungary and China relations politically are quite uh, good. Uh, uh, we support each other's basic uh, interests and uh, uh, show great concern to each other. And uh, I think uh, Hungarian government also support uh, most of the Chinese government uh, uh, political, uh, I mean, uh, agenda. Uh, and there is not a big, big uh, uh, problem between um, Hungary and China. Uh, as for the economic cooperation, the uh, potential is big. And, and right now, I think that we have not reached the full potential. Uh, bilateral trade and bilateral investment and could be you know, increased if we could come down to uh, some, you know, uh, the concrete, you know, obstacles and to find a way to solve the problem. Like some Hungarian products coming to Chinese market, if there are, you know, uh, some, you know, obstacles and difficulties, uh, protection measures, I think, I believe there are, you know, and the uh, Hungarian side could, uh, you know, send the message strongly 
into the right government department, right person, right channel, I think we could quickly resolve this, you know, and, you know, uh, trade could be increased. Uh, uh, instead of uh, complaint, you know, we try to find a way to solve the problem. And, you know, we can build a more constructive kind of uh, uh, relation between two sides. Um, so very briefly, I uh, I don't anticipate any major drastic change in the in the political and economic uh, relations of the, of the two countries. So if we we can remember that when the Hungarian government launched the so-called Eastern Opening Strategy at the beginning of uh, of the uh, 2010s, uh, the major reason uh, behind that was that the Western European countries practically failed to, to recover quickly from the effects of the uh, financial and economic crisis. And not only Hungary, but other Central and Eastern European countries were seeking new uh, economic uh, relations uh, in the East to diversify their, uh, the structure of their economic uh, relations. And uh, well, we shall see, we could uh, see the similar story again if China and the Asian countries come out uh, quickly from, from the current crisis, uh, their market and, and business opportunities could be more appreciated from, from a European perspective as well. This is one part of the story. And the second part is, as, we, as our companies experienced in the last decade, China is a very difficult market. So uh, I think both parties still have a lot to do to, to, to help uh, to hunger and export uh, to grow in the future. Yes, yes, I agree. So we would, we, we should work together. No. I think this is a very good point to end the conversation because uh, there could be no better learning than this. So we should work together uh, in overcoming those difficulties. So if you have nothing to add, then I may call this conversation uh, an end to. Um, thank you very much uh, for your availability, uh, Professor Sue. Also, Mr. Gorski, thank you for, for, your, for your availability. Uh, I think this has been a very enriching conversation. I actually had some fears that uh, we will continue to experience technical difficulties, uh, not only in the beginning, but also, uh, but actually it didn't happen. So the connection was not faltering and it was, it was, uh, it was, quite smooth uh, at the end. So our worst fears didn't come actually alive. That's very good. Uh, we really hope to have in the near future, normal uh, events with you uh, in, either, uh, in either city. Um, and we can continue to this discussion. We are honored to work with uh, the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences and we are really looking forward to do this in the future as well. Uh, so again, thank you very much for uh, this enriching conversation. Uh, me personally, I learned a lot, of, lot uh, from it. And I think we should continue this cooperation and those uh, conversations. Uh, thank you very much for, for the audiences, uh, for the technical difficulties at the beginning. We look forward to join, uh, for you to join us at other events in the future and you can follow us on social media. But for now, uh, thank you very much uh, for the participants uh, and uh, see you very soon. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye -bye.